So good morning, everyone. We had a new grand rounds today. Uh, we had a very special speaker today. It's Dr. Uh, Kat San. She's an associate professor at the University of uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, she has a training uh, first at uh, the medical school in uh, neurology residency at Columbia University. Then uh, after completing her uh, neurology residency, she went uh, to do a fellowship of multiple sclerosis at Mount Sinai. Uh, and uh, she stayed, uh, she finished this uh, uh, fellowship in 2013. Since then, she's uh, joining as a, a professor after finishing her fellowship. And she's been an active researcher. Uh, she's been in uh, multiple projects related to uh, MS and uh, the mechanisms of neurodegeneration uh, in MS. Um, and also has like been related to uh, the role of the uh, gut uh, microbiome and other like uh, uh, roles of the uh, diet to MS and also research involving the NMO. She has multiple publications, uh, different like uh, uh, peer review journals and also she's a very active uh, member giving like talks in the ANL uh, meetings. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kat San, she holds like projects on her own, but also she's involved in uh, multiple sclerosis clinical trial. And she's very involved in education, teaching uh, uh, residents and medical students among signed. And we had the fortune to have her uh, today uh, giving the grand round. So thank you, Dr. Kat San for like uh, joining us and giving the lecture. So you can start giving us your uh, lecture today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you for that introduction. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I will say that um, the lecture is on the longer side today. I have a lot of slides, so I will run through some things fairly quickly, um, but please feel free to uh, ask questions if you have along the way. I can't see you all on Zoom while I have the presentation open, um, but you can always put things in the chat that I could answer. We can do questions at the end. You can also, of course, feel free to email me um, and I'm happy to answer other things offline too. Um, and I tried to tailor this presentation for our entire audience, knowing that there's a, a range of backgrounds. Um, so hopefully that will be helpful to everybody. So today we're talking about the role of diet in MS, which I'm excited to talk about to you today. Oops, let's see if we can get the slides to advance, that would be good. There we go. Okay, so what we'll do today is we'll go through a, just a brief background about MS and pathophysiology. We'll talk about our rationale for why we're interested in the role of diet in MS. We'll go through some of the potential contributory mechanisms from a basic science standpoint in terms of how we think diet can influence MS, including the gut microbiota. We'll look then at the current evidence for both dietary components and then kind of overall patterns in MS and at the end, we'll, we'll finish up by, um, I'll share some very new and exciting research that we've completed with you. And we'll talk about some of the challenges and, and directions going forward. So just by way of a quick background, um, MS is both an autoimmune and also a neurodegenerative disease that affects the central nervous system. So the optic nerves, the brain and the spinal cord. Most of our patients are diagnosed between ages 20 and 40, although we do see pediatric cases as well as people diagnosed you know, into their 70s but most people between 20 and 40. There is a very clear um, female preponderance. About 70% of our patients are women. The prevalence in the US is about a million. And the clinical symptoms are referable to central nervous system dysfunction. And so those can range from motor weakness um, and coordination, difficulty with spasticity and spasms, uh, sensory symptoms, impairment of vision, which can be either inoptic neuritis, decreased vision, or uh, diplopia double vision, depending on what's involved, uh, sphincter dysfunction, cognitive impairment is extremely common, and mood disturbances are as well, mostly uh, depression. So it's really, it, it really is a, a, whole, a whole brain disease. Um, the diagnosis requires dissemination in space and time, meaning that this is not a diagnosis you can make based on a single event or a single lesion, unless you have evidence um, you know, through your scans or through, uh, you know, paraclinical testing that the disease is disseminated both in space and the brain or the cord, um, as well as over time. Phenotypically, we classify people according to 
uh, the presence or absence of inflammatory activity, which we refer to as relapsing disease, as well as whether or not they have gradual decline, which is the progressive component. Inflammatory activity is something we note either by someone coming in with new clinical symptoms or having new lesions on MRI or both. And just here at the bottom, I have just, to, you know, very briefly, um, typical looking MRI. So for the brain, this is a sagittal flare. And we can see there that wedge shaped uh, lesion that we have circled, which is perpendicular to the lateral ventricle. And that's a very typical uh, looking MS lesion. Um, similarly here, we have a spinal cord lesion, which is small and, and dorsal, well circumscribed and dorsolateral, very typical looking for MS. So we treat MS both with therapies that impact the underlying disease process, which we call disease modifying therapies, as well as with both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic treatments for symptom management. Um, all of our DMTs are immunomodulators and we've made a ton of progress over the last few years. Some of these work in the periphery as we see here, some of them work at the blood-brain barrier, for example, natalizumab, alpha-4 integrin inhibitor, which um, prevents lymphocytes from getting into the brain. And there are some that actually are able to get into the CNS and act there. Um, but, you know, all that being said, and the great progress we've made, treatment responses can be suboptimal, especially in people with progressive disease, where I would say the treatments are really modestly effective at best. Um, they come with significant potential toxicity, especially uh, infections. And obviously during the pandemic, we've had issues. Um, in particular, we have issues with our older patients. So the clinical trials tend to be done in young people. Uh, they tend to max out at age uh, 55 or age 60. Uh, and so we have kind of a lack of safety and efficacy data in, in our older patients, which is an issue as well. And for that reason, we, we still need to be working and doing better looking for things that can help our patients in terms of their, their overall prognosis. Okay, so I've just told you that I'm a neurologist and MS is a central nervous system disease. So why are we talking about the gut? Uh, I think there's kind of two big reasons. First is that people who are living with MS are really interested in this topic. I would say it's the most common question that people ask um, when I'm doing a new diagnosis visit is, you know, what can I do? And is there something different that I can do with my diet? Um, I think when people are diagnosed with MS, there's very commonly a feeling of loss of control over one's body, which is a very um, unsettling and powerful um, feeling. And this is something that people who are living with MS can do to be really proactive and to really um, do something that's taking their own health into their hands, uh, in addition to, of course, the medications that, that we provide. Um, but I think there's also a lot of appeal that this is kind of a natural approach. So um, that, that tends to sit well with people. On the other hand, and really at the same time, an extremely important part of this is that we have increasing scientific evidence that this actually matters. So we know that there's a strong environmental component to MS and that warrants us continuing our search for modifiable factors that can help impact the disease course. And we'll talk about those in a moment. We have good research at this point demonstrating obesity as a risk factor, both for MS onset and for worse outcomes. Um, Dr. Gustafson here has contributed a ton to literature looking at obesity and its effect on neurological diseases. And um, while that's not the focus of our, our talk today, it, it does kind of help us in terms of thinking about environmental factors and how they are able to impact the brain. We have good preclinical research, uh, which has helped us to look at potential mechanisms, including through gut microbiota, and we'll go through that today. And then we have some observational studies and early clinical trials. Okay, so we know at this point that MS is influenced both by genetics and by environment. So both the onset of MS, as well as prognosis in people with established MS seem to be impacted by certain genetic factors and certain environmental factors. In terms of the environmental factors that we've identified, we know that smoking, having a low vitamin D level, um, certain viral exposures, Epstein-Barr virus in particular has gotten a lot of attention over many years, but especially lately with that new paper that came out in science. Um, and then obesity, as I mentioned, are ones that I think we can, we can confidently say at this point are associated with MS onset, and all of these are associated with MS prognosis as well. However, on a relative basis, they, they clearly don't explain all of the risk. There's a big chunk left there. Uh, that's unexplained. So we need to be continuing our search 
And I think the gut is a really natural place to look. It's actually the main way that we interact with our environment. So we'll go through why we think that could be important. So how can diet affect MS outcomes? One is through immunomodulatory action. So I think, you know, diet really will go through the reasons why, but it really has the ability to impact MS much in the same way that our disease modifying therapies do. So um, if certain dietary factors are able to help us uh, modulate the immune system through their impact on T cell differentiation, cytokine production, um, actions on the innate immune system, those can potentially be helpful much in the same way as our DMTs are. Uh, I think an even more interesting avenue is really thinking about the idea of neuroprotection. So if there are certain factors that could help us protect against demyelination or protect against axonal and neuronal damage, even further that could help us potentially encourage remyelination and repair, obviously those would be things that, that um, can be really helpful. So this slide is not meant to overwhelm, but just to point out that um, at this point, we, we actually know quite a bit about the pathophysiology of MS. And what we've learned over time is a lot more complex than we used to think. We used to think of this as like a simple TH1, TH2 imbalance. And we know now that that's not true. There are actually so many different components of the immune system that are involved. And I think we should really just be looking at these all as opportunities. Um, so any intervention, for example, that could dampen TH1, TH17, or certain CD8 subtypes, or favor um, the development of FOXP3 positive uh, regulatory T cells can benefit MS in a method that actually would be similar to, to current DMTs. So in terms of neuroprotection, here we can see a proposed model um, that looks at neurodegenerative pathways leading to axonal loss in MS. So we can see here chronic CNS inflammation, you know, as opposed to thinking about in relapsing disease when people have a relapse and there's infiltration of lymphocytes that happens right at that moment and this big inflammatory lesion. We also have to remember, as I said, MS is a whole brain disease. Um, this is a process we think about mostly in our patients with progressive disease, but it actually happens throughout the course. It's just that we're able to see it more easily. It's more prominent later on. But we think that chronic CNS inflammation leads to reactive oxygen species, chronic hypoxia, further inflammatory cytokines. And over time, that leads to oxidative stress mitochondrial damage and dysfunction in the cells. Uh, the cells try to compensate for that. They redistribute ion channels, but with the state of chronic energy deficiency over time, it's not a sustainable strategy. And so we have uh, continued neuroaxonal death. And that's what is experienced by the patient as that gradual neurologic decline. In terms of opportunities for repair, um, so we know that remyelination happens in MS. Um, it happens better in people who are younger and earlier on in their disease, but we know that even in older people, the machinery for remyelination is there. And so again, if we can come up with different strategies, and uh, especially here we're talking about dietary factors that um, would be able to influence this process, this is another opportunity where, where something like diet could be helpful. Okay. So um, how is it possible exactly for diet to have an impact overall? What are the mechanisms? We can divide this into indirect effects related to comorbidities and then to direct effects. So in terms of the indirects, we're actually, um, I'll tell you about this briefly and then we're gonna put it aside for the rest of today. Um, indirect effects are those that are mediated by comorbidities that we know to be associated with worse outcomes in MS. And those are things like obesity, um, having a high LDL and other vascular risk factors like having diabetes, hypertension, there's been um, very nice work done by colleagues that has demonstrated all of these things to be associated with worse outcomes over time in MS. And of course, diet is related to all of these and it is a driver um, of these. However, today, what I'd like to focus on is let's take a look at what are the effects that we could uh, more directly uh, relate to diet. So for example, direct effects of dietary metabolites and then effects mediated through gut microbiota, both because the diet has important effects on the composition of the gut microbiota and because the diet induces the gut microbiota to uh, produce certain metabolites. So we think about our pharmacologic treatments, our DMTs as you know, chemical structures. They have particular downstream effects. We learn about the mechanisms. And I would argue that we really should be thinking about foods in the same way. 
So foods themselves, as well as those metabolites, um, when they're broken down, you know, they're just like our DMTs, um, they have different molecular structures and they're capable of stimulating different downstream effects really in the same way as our pharmacologics. And so that's why I like to think about them in the same way. In terms of those mechanisms, some of the uh, potential ways that we can see direct effects of dietary metabolites are, one is they can bind to G protein coupled receptors. These are metabolite sensing receptors that are expressed throughout the body on intestinal epithelial cells, metabolic organs like the liver and the pancreas, as well as immune cells. And we think one proposed pathway is through beta arrestin 2 which is an anti-inflammatory pathway. Those metabolites can also bind to uh, aryl, they can also bind to aryl hydrocarbon receptor. They can act as AHR agonist. Uh, this is the ligand activated transcription factor. We think, for example, tryptophan metabolites and flavonoids, which I'll get into a little bit later in the talk, can act this way. And the most exciting thing about this work um, for me is that these metabolites uh, have been demonstrated to pass through the blood-brain barrier and activate AHR on astrocytes. So that means they are able to uh, go from the gut uh, through the peripheral circulation and actually diffuse into the brain, bind to astrocytes, and then have effects there. And astrocytes are important supporting cells in the brain. And as we think about you know, our patients who have progressive MS and the models that I showed you about uh, what happens inside the CNS with chronic CNS inflammation and mitochondrial damage, if there's something that we can do to influence astrocyte behavior, that could potentially be very important. These metabolites can also act as HDAC inhibitors, which have broad anti-inflammatory effects, including an increase in the number and function of FOXP3 positive Treg. Okay, so now um, thinking about not just the direct effect of dietary metabolites, let's take a look at the effects of diet on the gut microbiota and how that might be important in terms of immune patterning and then also neurodegeneration. So just by way of quick background, uh, the microbiota are the collection of microbes that colonize the human mucous membranes and skin. It's kind of gross to think about. And I think most of the time we try kind of not to think about the fact that we are all filled with trillions of bacteria, um, but the, our bacteria help us for the most part. So the extent of what's of what's considered normal has really only been fairly recently characterized in the last you know, 10 years or so, this, this research has kind of taken off. We know that there is a symbiotic relationship between the human host and many different microbes. So our microbes are really important for processing of nutrients, uh, resistance to infection. We'll talk a bit about mucosal barriers and also immune system patterning. So we know that humans uh, do not, and all animals do not develop um, normal immune systems without exposure to bacteria, and they really have quite a bit of influence on our immune system. Every individual has their own unique microbial composition. It's fairly stable over time, uh, save, you know, big changes, and we're going to talk about some of those. And the role of microbiota in many disease states, particularly in autoimmune diseases, is a huge topic of investigation currently. So here's a few examples of papers, but there are many, many more in the literature um, talking about the influence of diet on gut microbiota composition and function. So I, I told you that um, every individual has their own unique microbiota. People's um, you know, gut microbiota is as unique as a fingerprint. Um, so how does that come to be? Well, there's a lot of different influences. So things like mode of birth, you know, were you born vaginally or by C-section? Were you breastfed as an infant? What kinds of infections did you have as a child? What antibiotic exposures have you had? You know, those, those things all will contribute to um, the development of your microbiota, which again, becomes sort of stable over time. The biggest uh, environmental impact as people, uh, you know, once that, that microbiome is established when you're young um, is really going to be diet. Um, importantly, not only is uh, the microbiota composition important in terms of which bacteria are there because the bacteria interact directly with immune cells, which we'll talk about in a moment, but also because the identity of those microbes impacts which metabolites are produced. And here what we can see is the links between particular bacteria and the production of certain short chain fatty acids. And those are really important metabolites that we're gonna talk about. So um, diet has an impact on the microbiota composition. We'll talk in a moment about why that's important. And then the composition in turn has, an, has important effects on the metabolite production. 
Okay, so let's look at some of these mechanisms in terms of diet and microbiome influence on immunity. First, let's take a look at epithelial integrity and function. So this schematic is uh, actually from IBD, but really it can be used in MS or any other autoimmune disease. And the idea here is that a huge role for the gut microbiota is to help maintain a healthy mucosal barrier in the gut. And so here we can see this health scenario. Um, we can see things kind of floating through the lumen, um, some like food there, some, uh, some bacteria there, and then these wavy lines, which is a mucosal barrier, which looks nice and full. And then um, between these cells, you see the tight junctions. And on the other side, you see the resident immune system of the gut, and then uh, a dendritic cell, a T cell, and you see these having influences out into the bloodstream. In the IBD setting, which again, we can talk about you know, other autoimmune diseases here too, um, what you see is a mucosal barrier that is not healthy. You see that the tight junctions are leaky and there are things that are getting through. And when that happens, um, the things that get through to the other side that don't belong uh, to be interacting with the resident immune system can improperly stimulate it. And we think that this is a, a nice model that, uh, for, for a break in immune tolerance for autoimmune diseases. Okay, next let's look at those actual interactions um, with the resident immune system in the gut and how, how the bacteria can have an influence. So just drilling down and looking here um, and we'll look right here. Okay. Okay, so zooming in on that interaction between microbes, dendritic cells, T cells, here we can see how dendritic cell activation by microbes polarizes the adaptive immune response. So dendritic cells recognize microbial components and metabolites. They use these pattern recognition receptors. For example, here, toll-like receptors. And once, the, so that's the actual interaction between the bacterial cell surface um, and the dendritic cell or a metabolite that's been produced by the bacteria and, uh, and that dendritic cell. So once that dendritic cell is activated, it can then present antigen, right? Um, it alters, uh, uh, cell surface expression of either co-stimulatory or inhibitory molecules that depends on what the stimulus was that, that the uh, dendritic cell received, right? And then it can release mediators like cytokines, additional metabolites, which then shape the adaptive immune response. So these different receptors can be differentially either activated or inhibited depending on the particular microbial species. And importantly for MS, this has an impact on T cell differentiation into what we know to either be more pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory phenotype. Okay, in addition, when you ingest different foods, the bacteria that are there are gonna produce varied metabolites depending on what is ingested. So even if there are, you know, even looking at one person's bacteria, other person's bacteria, exactly what's there, um, when you take a look at, at the composition of what is there, the metabolites that those bacteria are going, to, are going to produce are going to be different depending on what comes in. And so here we can see in this schematic, for example, dietary fiber, um, that leads the bacteria to produce short chain fatty acids, which are very important for the things we just mentioned, barrier integrity, immune homeostasis. And as I mentioned earlier, these metabolites are actually able to diffuse out into the peripheral circulation and then have distant effects, including in the brain. So to summarize this mechanistic piece of our discussion, I think we've established that diet can have an impact on systemic immunity. And this is accomplished by direct effects of dietary metabolites and also through effects mediated by gut microbiota composition and metabolite production, which I think we've shown have some far reaching effects. Okay. And this kind of leads us to uh, this whole concept of the gut-brain axis. And I like this slide. There are many different um, there are many different figures that people have made over the years that try to integrate this. But this one is nice because I think it, it pulls together some of the mechanisms that we were talking about. But here is just the concept of you know you can see here the gut, you can see here the brain, um, and then you can see all of these different interactions in terms of dietary metabolites. You see here the dendritic cell and how it's interacting, the short chain fatty acids how those are having an influence. Um, we talked about HDAC inhibition, uh, G-protein coupled receptor signaling, um, increasing regulatory T cells. We talked about the way some of these metabolites 
um, can then diffuse across the blood-brain barrier and activate a oral hydrocarbon receptor, and that can decrease inflammation right in, right in the brain. So it's kind of a nice way, I think, to put together these different mechanisms. Okay, so now that we finished the basic science part, let's actually talk about uh, what evidence we have for particular dietary components in MS. And I'll just kind of go through these. I've chosen the, to talk about the ones that I think people ask us about the most. So dairy is probably the question I get asked about the most. And patients will say, you know, I've heard that MS patients are sensitive to dairy and should I eliminate it? So um, like some of the other components, I think the evidence is really not fantastic either for or against. So there is a study here that uh, was done about 20 years ago looking at T-cell reactivity, found that uh, MS patients showed abnormally heightened responses to milk antigens. And in particular, the protein deuterophilin has been implicated um, through antigenic mimicry with MOG. So the idea being that uh, the immune system sees deuterophilin and gets kind of rubbed up against myelin in response. And so there's a question of whether this could be an inciting factor for the onset of MS, uh, as well as a question of in people with established MS, are, are they doing, if they are ingesting dairy, are they doing something kind of to further rev up their immune system and, and worsen their prognosis and therefore should it be avoided? Um, there are also some mechanistic studies that have looked at this in IBB, um, which showed, have showed that increased inflammation can also be mediated through the microbiome. So the proliferation of certain bacteria that, um, that favor inflammation when dairy is ingested. However, we really don't have uh, great clinical evidence in MS. There's been some registry studies that have tried to address this, looking at relationships between dairy intake and disability and things, um, but the results have been very mixed. So I usually just tell people, if dairy bothers you, avoid it. If you seem to tolerate it, fine. You know, we don't have specific evidence that it's making your MS worse at this time, but stay tuned, we'll see. Um, fat. We'll just very briefly go through the different types of fats and then we'll talk about them. So uh, just to remind people from high school chemistry, um, saturated fats, uh, so the fatty acid chain is completely saturated with hydrogen uh, and polyunsaturated fats. There are multiple double bonds and of particular interest in MS, omega-3 fatty acids have gotten a lot of attention and then monounsaturated fats where the fatty acid chain has one double bond. So saturated fats mostly come up in the context of people asking about meat and also dairy and other animal products. We know that saturated fats can raise LDL cholesterol. We know that, I, as I mentioned earlier, that in, in and of itself is associated with poorer outcomes in MS. Um, in terms of thinking about their, the mechanism, we know that saturated fats can activate some pro-inflammatory pathways like NF-kappa-B uh, through activation of toll-like receptors. And uh, from animal model studies, we know that long chain fatty acids that are typical in you know, Western diets um, can worsen EAE, which is our animal model of MS. And I just have one figure here um, demonstrating higher clinical scores among uh, mice with EAE who um, were fed a diet that was high in uh, long chain fatty acids as opposed to uh, control diet. Bringing them back to our mechanisms that we discussed earlier, there's been some nice work looking at the uh, exposure, what happens when a naive T cell is exposed to different fatty acids. And when a naive T cell is exposed to an environment in the gut that is rich in some of those things that come from Western style diets, these medium and long chain fatty acids, that naive T cell is going to tend toward um, growing up to become a Th1 or Th17 more so than a regulatory T cell. Um, so we think this is one potential mechanism that could underlie a problem with saturated fat. In terms of clinical studies, some people may be familiar with Dr. Roy Swank. He really was a huge pioneer in this field. Um, you know, he was studying diet in MS before anyone really was talking about this, um, going back to his study starting in the 1950s. Um, what he did was he ran an interventional study of a low saturated fat diet. So he assigned 144 people who were living with MS to follow this diet. There was no real control group. What he did was, and of course, this is not how clinical research is done in, in a modern era, um, was he just assigned people all to do it. And then he separated them later into good dieters versus bad dieters in terms of what they, you know, what they did. Um, 
and he followed people for 34 years. This study was published in Lancet in 1990. So there are a lot of obvious strengths to the study in terms of the length of follow-up um, and the size really, and the fact that he really did a good job with this follow-up. But unfortunately, because people self-selected, obviously that introduces a lot of bias and uh, health habits hang together, things like smoking, physical exercise. Um, so it, it's kind of hard to separate out the effects, but he was able to show that people who had um, better habits did better. They were still alive at the end of the follow-up period and their MS-related disability was significantly less. So I think that is, you know, there are definitely things we can learn here. Um, there's a prospective uh, pediatric MS study led by colleagues at UCSF, which I'll reference a few times here. Um, 219 children who were followed for an average of nearly two years and they completed food frequency questionnaires. A 10% increase in energy intake from saturated fat was associated with over threefold increase in the MS relapse rate. So I'll just let everyone just listen to that for a moment and just think about what effects our disease modifying therapies have. So this is an association, it's an observational study, but I think it's very interesting. And this association remained after they adjusted for multiple potential confounders. Okay, so polyunsaturated fats, these are uh, found in fish, walnuts, flax seeds. They have important animal model effects on immunomodulation, neuroprotection, remodulation and repair. And then there are some epidemiologic studies in MS, but these have had conflicting results. Um, so some studies showing importance of marine-based um, polyunsaturated fats, some, some other studies showing the importance of plant-based. There's also been some clinical trials looking at supplements, but they've been very small and not really powered to look at this as a disease modifier. So I would say in terms of all of the stuff, again, we don't have a, a conclusive answer. Fruits and vegetables, something I think is an easy thing, of course, for general health to tell people um, that they should work on. And in terms of how we think this might be helpful, we think it may be related to fiber intake. Uh, we mentioned before about how intake of fiber induces the gut microbiota to produce short-chain fatty acids. And short-chain fatty acids, as we talked about, um, well, I think I'll show this in a, in a moment. Remember that those help with barrier integrity as well as with um, effects on immune patterning and then have distant effects. We also mentioned briefly earlier, uh, flavonoids and uh, which is what gives fruits and vegetables their bright colors. They have important effects both on immunomodulation and neuroprotection and repair. I mentioned very uh, earlier the tryptophan pathway. This is, I think, one of the most interesting pieces of work in terms of uh, those of us who are, are trying to push forward working on, on diet in MS and in other neurological diseases. Um, and here, is, uh, here are the figures and the paper references here uh, that show tryptophan metabolites that are taken in by the diet, source being cruciferous vegetables here, and metabolized by gut microbiota. These metabolites are then able to diffuse into the peripheral circulation, cross the blood-brain barrier, bind to aryl hydrocarbon receptor and astrocytes, and so therefore have distant effects all the way in the CNS. In terms of clinical evidence, coming back to that pediatric study that I referenced earlier, a one cup equivalent increase in vegetable intake decreased the risk of relapse by 50%. So that's highly significant and similar in terms of effect size to what we see in clinical trials. Of course, again, this is not a clinical trial, it's an observational study, but I think still very interesting. Um, there's also a registry B study that I'll, that I'll reference a little bit later um, that found uh, a link between higher intake of fruits and vegetables and patient reported disability and disease activity. And then just a small interventional study suggesting um, mechanism may be through a re reduction in IL-17, which are pro-inflammatory cells. Grains and gluten is, I would say, other than dairy, the thing I get asked about most commonly and the one where we probably have the least evidence. Um, there have been very few studies that have tried to look specifically at gluten. Um, the results have been very mixed. And, uh, you know, with some saying it, people think it's harmful, some people think they actually think it's helpful or not gluten itself, but whole grains. So, for example, the NARCOM study, uh, which is a registry study that we'll talk about in a few minutes, done by one of my colleagues uh, looking at a huge MS registry in North America they found an association between higher intake of whole grains and a lower level of MS-related disability. That kind of goes against the gluten hypothesis there. Um, we think that, again, 
um, bringing it back to fiber, we think high fiber content may be of benefit because of induction of short chain fatty acids. And just to remind about this pathway, we talked before about the environment in which those naive T cells grow up. And here you can see in the bottom part of this pathway, as opposed to the top, where we said that you know Western um, diets favoring inflammatory cells, here you can see that diets that tie in fiber favoring production of short chain fatty acids can help induce um, those naive T cells to grow up to be regulatory T cells instead. Salt is another big topic. So um, this came through about 10 or so years ago. Um, from a mechanistic standpoint, we know that high salt intake induces T17 differentiation, and this is modulated through SGK1. T17 cells that develop in a high salt environment in the gut seem to be, not only is the number of them increased, but the, path, the pathogenesis of their phenotype is, is much greater. And mice who were fed a high salt diet had a worsened course of EAE, our, our mouse model of MS. From a clinical standpoint, I think what really popularized this topic was this study here by our colleagues in Argentina. They looked at 70 people who were living with relapsing MS and they stratified them according to their salt intake. So they classified people as medium, high, or low intake. And those who had medium or high intake compared to those who had lower intake had higher relapse rates over the two years and also had an increased number of T2 lesions. However, additional studies have failed to confirm this effect. So, and these are, you know, these are all observational. So that pediatric study that we talked about earlier, there's a case control portion of it where they compared um, the children who, had, who were living with MS to a set of controls and they found no difference um, between the sodium intake, the people who had, the children who had MS versus those who did not. In addition, in terms of their longitudinal follow-up study, they didn't find any link between uh, sodium intake and relapse rates. And then um, my colleague, Dr. Fitzgerald, who also ran the NARCOM study and who I work with frequently, um, also did this interesting study where what they did was they went back to the benefit trial, which was an old interferon trial in MS. Um, there were over 400 people in the trial. They were followed for two years and then an additional three-year extension. What they did was they went back to the trial and they pulled the urine samples, which had been stored. There were 14 samples per participant. So they were able to really reliably, they think, estimate dietary sodium, which you can do using this formula with urinary sodium. And they didn't find any particular link in either the placebo group from the trial or the treatment group in terms of dietary sodium and um, clinical relapses or MRI lesions. So I think this kind of leaves us with a big question mark. Okay, so now let's get into some of the patterns. So these are kind of the, the books that I would say our patients come in most frequently with. Um, and they'll say, okay, so I saw this on the internet and there, these things are totally different. Like this one recommends that I'm eating organ meats and this one is telling me I should be a vegan. So which one of these is right? And so I say, well, you know, what's, what's the evidence? We should try to do this in a way that's scientific in the same way that we think about our medications um, that we recommend to patients. I try to always make recommendations that are evidence-based, even when we're talking about lifestyle factors. And I think that's important, right? If we're asking someone to overhaul something about their lifestyle, we should, we should try to have good evidence for doing that. Okay. So I think what we have the best evidence for, uh, and this is, this is registry-based and is very limited, but up until now, this is, this is what we have had, um, have been these uh, registry studies. So I mentioned the NARCOM study, which is the North American Research Committee on MS registry. There are almost 7,000 people with MS who, um, there's even more that are in the registry, but about 7,000 agreed to complete a dietary screener questionnaire. And what Dr. Fitzgerald found was that people who were in the top quintile of their diet of the diet quality score, they developed this little um, you know, scale in terms of rating the diet, um, they were at 20% lower odds of having a high disability score compared to those who were in the bottom quintile. So this is all patient reported, it's observational, but I think again, this was interesting enough to us to say, you know, there's something here and we should continue studying it. In terms of the patterns that people are currently looking at in MS. There are a lot of them. Um, I have actually pull out slides on each of these, which I'm not going to show you today in the interest of time. Uh, I will summarize by saying that each of these has been uh, investigated or is being investigated, but um, all of these studies have been kind of small pilot design type studies, really looking more at feasibility, 
um, I'll get into our own version of that study in more detail since I can share the details of that with you. Um, but none of these have really been powered, at least as of yet, to really study the effects of these diets as a disease modifier. So most of these have been small pilots looking at feasibility and looking at symptoms, if anything. So those that include the swank diet, which we mentioned is a low saturated fat diet, a modified paleo diet, which is the Walls protocol, the Dougal diet done by our colleagues at OHSU, which is a plant-based, very low fat diet. Um, our colleagues at Hopkins and um, Wash U have also been looking at caloric restriction and intermittent fasting. Um, and uh, Dr. Brenton and colleagues have also been looking at ketogenic diet. And then we've been look, we, we have focused our efforts on a Mediterranean uh, mind type diet, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Um, in terms of translating this dietary research, um, I think you know, it, it has been very challenging and that's why the quality of the data that we have so far has really not been good enough to warrant um, you know, creating a set of guidelines for, for patients. Um, so let's take a look at some of those challenges. In terms of doing observational studies of diet and MS, um, you have to think about how, you know, what's your appropriate study population? So I mentioned before the NARCOM study. Well, the NARCOM study is great, um, but it, it is an older MS population. It is specifically people who volunteered to be part of a registry. Um, you know, when you send out a specific survey, like a survey on diet, um, only people who are interested in being part of that particular one are going to reply. So there's a lot of biases introduced there. And then everything is, is patient reported. So thinking about a study population, um, the reliability of your dietary data collection. So in terms of um, your methodology, you have to have a balance between the level of detail and participation. So if you send people a food frequency questionnaire that has 130 questions on it, you're gonna get a great level of detail, but you're not gonna get as many participants. And then again, you, you introduce biases in terms of like people who maybe are cognitively impaired or have mood issues are not gonna uh, be able to do that quite as well. And so maybe you're gonna to decide to do, use a screener or a shorter questionnaire instead, which will be less informative, but we'll get better participation. So that's an issue. Um, a huge problem is that as we know, dietary habits are associated with a lot of other things. So other health-related behaviors like exercise and smoking, medical comorbidities, socioeconomic status, education. So you have to really be diligent, I think, when you're doing observational work in general, but I think especially here, um, with uh, making sure that you are appropriately controlling for all of those potential confounders. If you wanna do an observational study uh, longitudinally, you have to kind of go out a few years, especially in MS if you're thinking about using imaging or clinical outcomes. Um, you know, it takes time to see things, especially because our patients are on disease modifying therapies. And fortunately they work fairly well, um, such that any effect size, you know, is gonna be decreased. And we'll talk about that in the clinical trials part of this too. But other things to keep in mind are that the diet could change over time um, and people also uh, come out of the study. In terms of challenges for clinical trials, Feasibility is definitely difficult for recruitment. Um, when you're thinking about a study that requires a big lifestyle change, especially the idea of randomizing someone to that. So you may have someone who's like, okay, I'm ready to change my diet. Well, are they gonna really wanna be randomized into a study where they might get randomized into the control group? That's tough. Um, it's, that's always an issue with, with trials, but obviously for lifestyle, they have the option to then go out and do it on their own if they're randomized into the control group. Whereas in a pharma trial, they usually don't have the option to go out and get the study drug somewhere else, right? Um, adherence is difficult to measure. There are of course biases and self-reported data and the biological markers for looking at adherence are really not very good. So that is problematic. Um, how to best promote adherence. So, um, you know, things like uh, group meetings, emails, you know, phone calls, there's a lot of different ways that you can do this. Um, what's an appropriate control group. So you could potentially use a weightless control, but that's gonna prolong the length of your study and that can help, that, that can be difficult in terms of funding issues. Blinding to the group assignment is obviously not possible. And that's something I think we just have to accept if we're gonna say that this research is important and needs to be done. Um, it's definitely always a criticism that comes up in, in grant applications. And it's just, there's, there's nothing that we can do about it, right? We can't blind people to their diet. How do we select the intervention? So should we be looking at a popular diet um, that people are interested in on the internet versus a rational diet that we design? 
And then uh, in terms of what we should be studying, should we be looking at individual dietary components? For example, should we be doing a trial of uh, low salt diets? Versus should we be looking at their overall dietary pattern? I prefer looking at the overall dietary pattern, although looking at an individual component is cleaner because I think it's much more informative in terms of advice we're gonna be giving to, to our patients. Should the food be pre-prepared and provided by the study versus um, should the participants be preparing it themselves? So again, there are advantages and disadvantages to each. Obviously, when the food is provided by the study, um, you know, we know exactly what people are eating. It's much easier to track adherence. I think the problem is then when you think about how to generalize your results to the population, you know, unless you're going to come up with a product that's going to be sold that people can buy, I think it's hard. And so that's why I've preferred to attempt to uh, make dietary changes through education. I think you also want to have something that's going to be sustainable for people in the long term. Study endpoints. So we mentioned again, the disease modifying therapies are, are fairly effective at this point. And so your effect size is gonna be reduced by people who are already on those. This is gonna be an add-on standard therapies. And so um, you are gonna need a larger sample size. And it can be hard to actually estimate the effect size in an area where we don't have prior data. Power calculations can be very difficult. And then the funding environment. I think in the past few years, we've gotten a lot more attention to this area from funders, but uh, it's still, I think, a tough area to get funded. And it's, it's also hard to find people who are really qualified to review the application to understand all of these issues. So for us, I mentioned we ran a study, which I will tell you about now, of a, a small a pilot study looking at a Mediterranean style diet. And there were a few reasons why we decided to go with this diet as compared to some of the other ones that I had mentioned. So first of all, the general health benefits are well-established. I think it's important to remember that when you are treating someone who has MS, that's a person who is a whole person. It's not just a, a, someone who has a, a specific disease. And so I think it's important to be looking at patterns that have general health benefits. And you know, we don't want to put someone on a diet that is going to help their MS, but it's gonna give them a heart attack. That's not gonna be helpful, right? Um, there's some great data in cognitive aging where they're a lot more advanced than, than we are in MS. Um, and there are a lot of parallels between cognitive aging, Alzheimer's disease, and MS, although the pathology is very different, of course, there are some commonalities in terms of immune system activation and mitochondrial dysfunction. And I think we can really learn here. Um, the other nice thing about this diet is that it combines the limited available information that I presented to you earlier from preclinical research about which dietary components might be important. I also think it's reasonable to aim for long-term adherence with this type of pattern. Um, it's really more of a lifestyle change than a quote diet. I think, you know, we all know that diets don't work in the long term because people do them for a short period of time and then they kind of just float back to their regular habits. Whereas if you can get people to make a sustainable change uh, in the way that they think about food and the way that they prepare their food, I think that is something that in the long term is going to be much more beneficial. This can also be a very budget friendly intervention with some education. And uh, a really nice thing about it is since it's healthy for everyone, um, and since there's so many choices, I think it's a nice thing to be able to implement for people's whole household. So it's, it's definitely a big struggle when people say like, well, I'd like to change my diet, but my partner this or my kids that. Um, this is actually a pattern that everyone can enjoy and it's gonna be healthy for everyone. So I think it's a, it's a nice choice. So we ran a small pilot study of this modified Mediterranean diet, which uh, encouraged foods that were high in mono and polyunsaturated fats, high in fiber. Um, we completely eliminated meat and dairy, not because I necessarily think we have enough evidence to say that these are definitely bad, um, but because I think there was enough there that for a pilot where we wanted everything to be very clean we wanted to actually make it kind of as restrictive as possible to see whether people could do it. Um, we thought it would be helpful to kind of start there. So that's what we did. We limited salt to two grams a day, but we did it in a, in a way that I think was fairly straightforward, which is we basically had people eliminate processed foods. And when you cook your own foods, it's actually pretty hard to eat um, more than two grams of salt a day. We randomly assigned women living with MS to either this intervention or to not follow this intervention for six months. And we did this through intensive training with the dietitian. We had handouts, menus, recipes, grocery lists, and a lot of support for people. 
We then had monthly group meetings as well as routine contact between meetings to try and help people with adherence. And in terms of assessments, we did collect some biological markers, but as I mentioned, those are really not super useful. Um, we did a lot of dietary recalls. Uh, we did questionnaires. We did questionnaires uh, repeatedly. We had people fill out a self-assessment every time they came in every month for their group meeting. We uh, encouraged them to be as honest as possible. We reminded them every time that it was um, this was anonymous and we're not looking at their name and we're not going to be upset if they didn't adhere, but we, you know, this is information that's important for us. We also collected some specimens for microbiome and metabolomics, and we looked in an exploratory way at fatigue and, and some other outcomes, which I'll share with you. Our target was to enroll 30 people from our own center in one year. We actually were able to exceed that and we enrolled 36 in only nine months, and we were very pleased with our screening rate. 18 out of 18 participants in the intervention group completed the study and 16 out of 18 in the non-intervention group for an overall rate of 94%. And the self-reported adherence at six months was 90%, which we were very pleased with. Our goal was at least 80. We can see here that people did change their diet. Um, if you look at all of these food groups that we were interested in, you can see that people with their, who were in the dietary intervention group as compared to control had significant changes in all of these groups. And again, you know, here, this is just showing the kind of a similar thing in a different way. We can see that the percentage of people who met the recommended intakes for a Mediterranean diet in the US um, for each of these categories increased significantly uh, in the, for the people who were following the dietary program. Our participants did lose weight. We didn't counsel them to do that, but they lost on average about one pound per month. Uh, we gave them no counseling regarding calories. It was really only about the content of the diet, uh, but they did lose a little bit of weight. We were very pleased to see that although the study was, you know, six months and uh, very small, that there was a significant impact on fatigue and participants uh, in the dietary intervention group clearly did better uh, in terms of fatigue compared to people who were in the control group. We also had an effect on the MS impact scale 29, which asks people questions about the impact of their MS in daily life. Probably the most surprising finding to us, given that this was a six month study, it's you know, fairly short in terms of assessing disability, but um, in people who, in the, who were in the dietary intervention group, uh, their score on the expanded disability status scale, which is a standardized version of the neurologic exam, seemed to stabilize or even decrease slightly as compared to people who were in the non-intervention group whose scores were kind of all over the place, but in general tended to be stable or increased. Okay, so then wh where did we go from there? We said, okay, we finished this pilot. We know this is feasible. We know we can enroll people. We know that it's gonna help their symptoms, but we'd like to look at this more as a disease modifier. We'd like to really scale it up. Before we design a study that's gonna have, you know, 300 or, or more people in it, looking at this intervention, I think we need to do a little work first um, on the observational side to try and look at this as a disease, whether this can actually be a disease modifier. So looking at outcomes on, you know, disability outcomes over time, um, looking at MRIs, and to try to help us estimate some effect sizes so we can figure out our power calculations for doing an interventional study. So we decided to really focus in on this whole Mediterranean and also this uh, MIND, uh, more specifically score. So uh, the MIND diet is Mediterranean DASH intervention for neurodegenerative delay. It was developed by colleagues at Rush. And um, the idea was to not only be looking at, you know, Mediterranean style foods, but to have specific pullouts for things that we thought that people thought would be of benefit um, in neurodegenerative disease. And so you'll see here, not just like vegetables, but there's a pullout for green leafy vegetables and not fruits, but actually there's something here for berries. Um, and so everyone gets assigned a score of uh, zero to 15, depending on their answers to these different, uh, these different questions in terms of the scale. And there's a nice literature for the MIND diet in uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So we hypothesized the potential benefit for neurodegeneration and MS in addition to possible uh, immunomodulatory benefits. So the first place we looked at this was in our radium cohort. So our radium cohort is Reserve Against Disability in Early MS, which is an NIH funded longitudinal study of risk and protective factors for disability in people with very early MS. We enrolled 185 people who were within the first five years of diagnosis. We did this back in 2016, 2017. The average age was uh, 34. 
66% were women, 20% Black, and 23% Hispanic. So this was a very nice uh, sample in terms of being very reflective of the demographics at our center. And their average disease duration at enrollment was only two years. So these are people with very early disease who were very young. And at baseline, all participants underwent this detailed clinical assessment. They had research MRI and they did a food frequency questionnaire. I'll tell you, there were a lot of findings from this uh, and uh, the Radium's cohort in general has put out many, many different, uh, really fantastic Dr. Smowski's work, uh, fantastic papers on all kinds of things that we're learning, um, but specifically related to diet and mind diet, I'm gonna show you just the main finding from that paper, uh, which we published just last year which is that there was a very significant association between people's mind diet score and their, uh, the volume of the thalamus. So thalamic atrophy is really the first thing that we see in people with MS in terms of abnormalities in the brain MRI, besides lesions, but when we're talking about brain volume, later on in disease, you know, we see a lot of whole brain atrophy um, and of course clinical disability, but at the early part of disease, um, there are abnormalities in thalamic volume. And the fact that we were able to see an association between people's mind diet score and their volume of their thalamus so early in disease was very, very interesting to us. Since this change is something that's kind of ubiquitous, it's seen throughout the course of MS. Um, so this to us was very encouraging that, well, this may be something that we can do um, that will actually be, you know, have some neuroprotective effects going forward. We haven't finished analyzing the three-year follow-ups yet. We don't have the imaging data back, but we have the first 72 participants who completed those, that imaging data is done um, for, for thalamic volume at least. And we were very encouraged to see that there does seem to be a longitudinal relationship here as well. Lastly, I'll tell you about our clinical MS cohort. Um, this is work that we're gonna be presenting at the upcoming uh, AAN meeting in Seattle in a week and a half. And I hope to be able to see some of you there. We'll be presenting this on uh, Monday the 4th in the afternoon. So you guys can get a, get a sneak peek here. Um, so we wanted to then, for the Radiance cohort, the issue is we can't really look at clinical disability, at least at the baseline, because as I mentioned, people are in their 30s only and they're within two years of their MS diagnosis. So thankfully they're really not clinically disabled. And so you can't really look at associations with disability in that cohort. We will over time, um, but not on the baseline. So what we did was um, we wanted to look at kind of a broader group. So we took a look at a different cohort that we have, which is a clinical cohort. We have a comprehensive annual assessment program, which is led by my colleague, Dr. Samowski, the neuropsychology focus. All people who have MS who come to our center are eligible for referral. And the idea is for people to get once a year this really comprehensive evaluation. Um, and I'll show you the list of assessments. Um, but the idea is to really take a solid look at people in addition to them getting a yearly MRI. And of course their exams and histories with us, um, we get kind of some more objective data every year. We do have a current prospective longitudinal study that's focused on looking at predictive value of this dietary pattern going forward. Um, but what I'm gonna show you today is a retrospective view of the baseline assessment that we completed recently. So all participants completed this 14 item uh, Mediterranean dietary screener, um, and that enabled us to derive this score. Everyone completed objective sensory motor and cognitive testing in person. Uh, we used the MSFC, the multiple source of functional composite, which includes the nine hole peg test for hand function, the time 25 foot walk test for walking, and the symbol digit modalities test for cognition. We also looked at patient reported outcomes. We looked at the MS impact scale, the fatigue severity scale, MS walking scale, perceived deficits questionnaire, which asks people about cognition. And then we also looked at mood with the hospital anxiety and depression scale. And then lastly, we measured third ventricle width. We did this in an exploratory way as like a proof of concept metric. So as opposed to our other cohort where people had research MRIs, this is a clinical cohort, but we were able to pull the clinical MRIs uh, from the chart and just kind of use uh, third ventricle width as a proxy for cerebral atrophy. So this has been validated in MS specifically. It correlates very well with thalamic volumes, um, but it also correlates actually reasonably well with other brain volumes. So this is not as, you know, as accepted as a research metric, but um, for clinical, we thought it would be very interesting. Um, we collected a ton of covariates. As I mentioned before, we thought this was really important. So we collected this entire list here of demographic covariates, age, sex, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status. We derived this very comprehensive index to control for a lot of different things, 
And then we looked at all of these health-related covariates as well. So body mass index, exercise, sleep, um, and then all, all these different medical comorbidities. We wanted to control for all of these factors in our analysis to make sure that the effects that we were observing were not gonna be just attributed here. Um, in terms of statistical methods, the main thing is to say that the primary analysis used multiple regression to look at associations between that MSFC and the Mediterranean diet, accounting for all of these covariates. We looked at 563 patients with an average age in their 40s, and the demographics were very similar to in our radiums cohort, which we're very happy about, again, because it means that these are, this is generalizable. And our main finding was that we found uh, that higher Mediterranean diet score predicts a better, better MSFC. And that is after adjusting for all of the demographic and health-related covariates that I showed you. Uh, this table is just here you, for reference. You can look at this later, and hopefully when our paper comes out, um, but what you can see is that all of the patient reported outcomes were also significant, and all of these withstood correction for multiple comparisons using Bonferroni correction, except for anxiety. So we thought this was very interesting. Um, something that I thought people will find very interesting is that when we looked at relapsing versus progressive patients here, what we found is, of course, our progressive patients tend to be much more disabled than our relapsing patients. And you can see that huge gap when you look at quartile one there between the blue relapsing and the red progressive. However, when you get out to the fourth quartile, you can see that that gap narrows. And so it seems that it's possible that having a higher Mediterranean diet score actually attenuates that negative impact of a progressive disease course on MSFC. And the same thing for disease duration uh, on the bottom. You can see that when you look at quartile four, there's actually no difference between people who had the disease for a long time versus a short time. So we thought this stuff was very interesting. And then lastly, um, cerebral atrophy measured by third ventricle width seems to actually mediate this relationship, suggesting that there's a neurodegenerative mechanism at play here. Um, we have a lot of future research that we're planning to do over time and happy to discuss with anyone if anyone's interested in, interested in collaborating. We're always looking for people to work with. Um, and lastly, we have a, a really exciting and fantastic patient wellness program that is attempting over time to pull in all of these things that we're learning from research um, into patient care. Um, I think we're out of time, so I'm going to skip these conclusions, but I think you guys, you guys saw it all today. Um, I will just very briefly say thank you to all the wonderful people that I work with and um, our patients who participated in all of our studies, and I always end with a picture of my crew at home. So thank you all so much for your attention. I know it was long. Thank you so much, Dr. Katzan. It was an amazing presentation. So I think we had time for one question and then uh, let's see uh, why we just, we need to do the announcement. So any questions from the audience? The microphone is open, so you can go ahead. Also, you can write questions in the chat. There is. Uh... You can also feel free to email me. I may have scared everybody by this <laughs> not very long presentation. No. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, I didn't put everyone to sleep. But... No, I think like uh, uh, I mean, if there, there is no questions right now. I think like uh, we can like, can provide also your email. It's, oh, there is a question actually. Uh, yeah, this is from one of our residents in from the chat. Do you know any data about coffee or uh, antioxidants? Yeah, it's a really it's a really good question. The you know the coffee and antioxidants would fall into that category of flavonoids that I mentioned, um, and uh, there have been a couple of small studies uh, trying to look at this and suggesting potential neuroprotective effect um, in MS, but nothing that's been large enough to be able to make a clinical recommendation to patients. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Katza. So I think we're gonna uh, you, stop here right now, but I think if there's any more questions from the audience, so we're gonna just like, write it to you, like uh, send you an email. I think Please. also some resident might be interested to do MS as well. So I think in the okay. future they can contact you if they have like okay. any like questions. Uh, okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Katza. So thank you so much, take care. Yeah, so now please everyone stay. So Dr. Uh, Perth wants to make an announcement. Hi, everybody. So first of all, uh, thank you very much to Dr. Elena Katzen for this very insightful and informative grand rounds. 
um, and as for the announcement uh, today, so um, most of you or many of you have uh, took, uh, taken part in the surveys that we sent uh, that included both uh, uh, faculty and residents and staff uh, to recommend who should be uh, next year uh, chiefs, uh, chief residents, adult chief residents. And so um, it is my really special pleasure to introduce uh, uh, three perfect role models as next year's uh, adult chief residents who thankfully agreed to take on themselves this uh, thankful, thankless job. Um, Hazel Karkasuts, Srinath Ramaswamy, and Liz Monahan. So please join me in congratulating them and us um, for next year's adult uh, chief residents. Um, and I don't know if uh, Dr. Reznikov is here. I'm here actually. Okay. Okay, our choices are usually not very suspenseful, but uh, next year's chiefs and they're going to be joining the adult chief presidents would be Lisa Calva, who is sitting right next to me, um, and uh, Fatime uh, Mohammedpour, who is in uh, Iran right now, so he, she cannot join us. So I congratulate all the chiefs and uh, we look forward to a wonderful year next year with them. Congratulations. Congratulations, guys. Thank you. Okay, everyone. So congratulations again to the new chiefs, and I'm going to be working with you. Thank you, everyone, for attending to your rounds, and I'll see you next time.